Uh, Alexander, are you going to speak for how long, uh, approximately, first? Well, you know, I'll, I'll give my talk and then there'll be time for questions. Okay. Uh, I've been told there is a problem with sound. Everybody else can hear me? Okay, so somebody has a sound problem. Maybe uh, it's their problem, not the general problem. Okay, so um, I'm gonna mute myself and um, I'm gonna come back when you're done. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you. And so um, thank you for giving me the chance to present my work to, um, to a new audience. And thank you everyone for coming. It's uh, nice to see um, you know friends and, uh, and so forth. The um, topic I'm, I'm speaking on today is a topic of long interest to me, but also the subject of my current book research. I'm writing a book about uh, Pan-Slavism, and the title of the talk is about effacing Pan-Slavism, uh, the meaning of which should become clear as I give the talk. Uh, perhaps the first thing we should start with is, uh, what is Pan-Slavism? That turns out to be a complicated question that lots of people are answering in different ways. Indeed, if you look at the standard literature on Pan-Slavism, you can see a great effort at terminological differentiation. People want to contrast Slavism with Neo-Slavism or Pan-Slavism with Slavophilism. And all these taxonomies of Slavisms are, um, have not resulted in any consensus definitions of any of these terms. Um, I don't want to offer a definition of Pan-Slavism myself. I don't feel that that's my job or my responsibility. But I do want to give a brief description of the sort of thing I have in mind when I talk about Pan-Slavism. So to that end, I want to give you the original definition of Pan-Slavism for the first published work to reference Pan-Slavism. Uh, here it is, it's a Latin language text. Uh, it defines Pan-Slavism as unity in literature among all the Slavs. This is the true Pan-Slavism, a unity in literature to be achieved by um, orthographic reform. So the, the key thing to note about this definition is that it is a literary movement. It's a type of language planning. We want to change our alphabets. We want to um, have a literature of a certain fashion. And those are the issues that we're concerned with in Pan-Slavism. Please note in this discussion, the absolute lack of any reference to founding a Slavic state or unifying with Russia or anything like that. I often find when I speak on Pan-Slavism, people sort of scratch their heads, become confused. Where's the Russian expansionism? Where's the pro-Romanov feeling? And there isn't any. It's, this is about uh, spelling reform and orthographic reform and literary questions. I hope that um, the further meaning of Pan-Slavism will become clear as I actually discuss the Pan-Slavs that I'm interested in. Now this um, literary Pan-Slavism, if you like, um, hasn't gotten a lot of attention in the scholarly literature. Uh, and I think it's partly because scholars of nationalism a lot of them are interested in the state. They're interested in people who are founding a state or seeking a state or how do we create the state. And the, um, the literary interests of my guys doesn't fit into that template very well. Now I have repeatedly published about how nationalism doesn't need to see a state and you can see my uh, published works on that if you're interested. <clears throat> but I think that's part of the reason why the literary Pan-Slavism hasn't gotten a lot of attention. But I think the other reason literary Pan-Slavism hasn't got a lot of attention is because the scholarly literature on it is terrible. Um, the, there's actually a, a scandal in the historiography, um, an outrageous uh, series of scholarly misconduct in which um, scholars routinely misquote primary sources, miscite the names of books. Uh, the most elementary rule that anything inside the quotation marks has to remain the same is routinely violated in the discussion of these Pan-Slavs, which is, uh, very curious, but also shocking. So what I'd like to do is uh, outline this scandal and um, discuss why it might have happened. And the way I'd like to proceed is I'd like to discuss three sample Pan-Slavs in some detail. Here are my three Pan-Slavs, Jan Kolar, Ludovic Guy, and Ludovic Stur. Um, Kolar is a Slovak, uh, Guy is uh, from, did most of his work in Zagreb, and Stur is a famous uh, Slovak awakener, or remembered as such. But I want to suggest that all three of these, um, these figures were primarily Slavs and saw themselves in Slavic terms. So I'm going to introduce their work in, um, at a detail that may seem initially a little bit excessive. I'll show you scans of their original documents so you can see the text for yourself. And then I'll discuss how the historiography has discussed these people and show you this scholarly misconduct that I've uh, analyzed. So that's the structure of the talk. 
Let's start with Jan Kolar. Jan Kolar was a Lutheran pastor, but is remembered primarily as a poet. He wrote a, a famous uh, epic poem called Slava di Sera, the daughter of Slava. Slava here being not necessarily the Slavs, but a name. It was such a huge success that he later published an expanded version. Um, a sample text um, from this passage is, is this. Uh, translated, it means from Athos to Triglav to Pomerania, from Skov to Kosovo Field, place name, place name, place name, place name, three um, stanzas of place names. Sing brothers, you and I, um, this is our homeland, Sheslavia. So just to give you a sense of um, what this means as a symbolic geography, I took all these place names and put them on a map. Here's the map. Now I suggest to you this, these place names uh, is a description of Slavdom. This is not a, a Slovak symbolic geography. Even the most expansive Slovak is not claiming Dubrovnik, Mount Athos, St. Petersburg, or Astrakhan. This uh, geography only makes sense as a pan-Slavic geography. So Kolar Slavia, the geographical clues suggest, is not uh, Slovakia, but rather all, all the pan-Slav world. Now Kolar was born in what is today the Republic of Slovakia. He spent most of his life in Hungary. Uh, so, you know, in terms of modern national ethnonyms, Slovak is the word that fits him best. But in terms of his own ideology, I say he's more of a Slav than a Slovak. You can see his Slovak ideas in greater detail, though, if you look at his prose works. So he wrote an essay on what he called literary reciprocity. That was his big sort of, you know, buzzword catchphrase, reciprocity. Reciprocity between what? Between the tribes and dialects of the Slavic, uh, Slavic people. And note the word dialect, not uh, meaning dialect. In this passage, he uh, talks about Slavdom as a many tribed nation. Uh, and one of those tribes is the, the tribe consisting of we Slovaks, Bohemians, Moravians, Silesians, and in part, Lusatians too. He means uh, Upper Silesians. Slovaks, Bohemians, Moravians, Silesians, Upper uh, Lusatians together form what he calls a Narodny Kmen, a national tribe. And we, but this national tribe has to be seen in the context of great Slavdom, all Slavo brothers are one nation. So we have the Slavic nation, we have a, a tribe, which you know, looks a little bit like Czechoslovakia, Bohemia, Moravia, Slovakia. Um, so the Slovaks are neither a nation or even a tribe, but rather some sort of subcategory of a tribe of the Slavic nation. He expanded on those ideas in a German language text. The uh, Czech language text um, was hard to read for Slavs who weren't from the Czechoslovak region. So you know, Serbs and, and Slovenes and so forth asked him to do a, a German version. The German version explicitly says um, the tribes and dialects of the Slavic nation, you can see at the bottom. Again, we see that the Slavs are one great folk speaking one great language. The Sprache is a German word for language. And this language is divided into Mundarten, and the nation is divided into tribes. So Stamm being the normal word for tribe. Now this idea of, a, um, of uh, the different Slavic literatures being merely dialectical may strike you as odd. I mean, the uh, Russians had their own literature and so forth. But uh, this idea is fairly common at the time. It's not difficult to find grammars of a Croatian dialect or grammars of an Illyrian dialect and so forth. You may not find this comfortable to view these things as merely dialectical. There's a lot of linguistic theory that says it's actually the very act of writing a grammar book or writing a dictionary. The codification process is what transforms, transforms dialects into languages. If you're a fan of that sort of linguistic theory, that theory is going to be difficult to apply to my Slavic intellectuals who are happy to see Russian literature, Polish literature, or Illyrian literature or Czech literature as dialectical Dialect of what? Dialect of the great Slavic language spoken by the great Slavic nation. Kolar's specific taxonomy of uh, the Slavic world is, um, is a little bit hard to, to, uh, to show the original PowerPoint slides. It's in a complicated list. I have taken the liberty of making a, a sort of tree by sort of cutting and pasting. But here's the basic idea. The Slavic language has these uh, four main dialects, Illyrian, Russian, Polish, and Bohemian Slavic. And then the dialects have sub-dialects. Um, now, in his uh, in his Vexilizeitschkeit, he doesn't actually give the subdialects of Bohemian Slovak, but in the other text I showed you, he does. So we can look at it that way as well. 
And then in the in the Czech version, he gives the same taxonomy with uh, with uh, with pretty much the same ethnonyms. Now, I think the the traditional way to analyze this sort of a taxonomy is to look at the original or look at the individual ethnonyms or glottonyms and say, "Ooh, look, there's no Macedonian at all." And look, Ukrainian is listed only as a subcategory of Russian. So, you know, the individual ethnonyms, what is their status? But I would like to point out the, the meta structure of this taxonomy. It's a three layer taxonomy with the language on the left and the, the, the sub dialects on the right. Here are his original terms. We have in German the Sprache, which is divided into, into Leben, Gebildete, and Dialekte, which in turn divided into Mundarten and Untermundarten. And in Slavic, he talks about the Slavic Yazik, which is divided into Narsechi, and the Narsechi are divided into Mienchis Narsechi or Pod Narsechi. So these are his terms. You know, this, is, this is what you find in historical text. Now, um, some scholars have, um, have become a little confused by this. Um, David Cooper here has this passage uh, summarizing Kolar's work. He says, for the Slavic nation to become enlightened, fulfill its mission, it must overcome its division into dialects. So that's uh, Cooper's description of Kolar's you know, agenda. I think Cooper has slightly misspoken. Uh, really, the nation should be divided into tribes, shouldn't it? Or if it's going to be a division into dialects, shouldn't it be the, the Slavic language divided into those dialects? So on the one hand, I want to niggle Cooper a little bit. But on the other hand, I can tell you that Cooper has really gotten into the Kolarian mindset. Kolar makes a, a very consistent equation, nation equals language, tribe equals dialect, and he's interested in promoting the great Slavic nation with its great Slavic language by thinking about the relationships between the different tribes, each speaking their own dialects. So nation language, uh, dialect tribe. Some of Kolar's plans to, um, to bring the Slavic tribes and dialects together uh, are worth uh, looking at. He suggested, for example, founding a pan-dialectical literary magazine. So the idea is that uh, an ardent Slav who is interested in the literary products of all tribes, not just his own tribe, might be able to read about new literary productions in this, in this common magazine. So if there's a new play out in Polish, you can read about it in Polish. And look, there's new poetry published in the Serbian. Let's read about that in Serbian. Oh, short stories in, in Czech. Let's read about them in Czech. It's um, a, a magazine that doesn't sound very um, plausible to me. And uh, certainly a lot of people in historiography have made fun of this proposal. But it's worth pointing out that such uh, magazines are actually founded. Um, a scholar in, um, in Warsaw wrote a literary magazine in which uh, literary products from all over the Slavic world were translated into the different dialects of the Slavic nation. So here, for example, you have uh, some new Czech poetry by Hanka, and you get the uh, original Czech along with uh, a great Russian, Polish, and little Russian translation. And you can see uh, other varieties of, of other translations. You know, I mean, there's something else where there's a Czech original and there's a Serbian translation because an ardent Slav wants to read about the literary products of other dialects of uh, other tribes of his great Slavic nation. And this, uh, you know, from Warsaw, from the Russian empire. Kohler also wanted orthographic reform, which is the, the consistent feature of Pan-Slavism. You saw that uh, Herkel's original text with the original definition was also about orthographic reform. Um, the, the, the writings of Pan-Slavs are filled with, uh, with passages that look like this, showing the great um, spelling diversity in different um, Slavic varieties. Just to give a, you know, to one sample, if you look at this column for the word six, you can see uh, that we have uh, the words shest, 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 and shest. And the point is, gosh, those really all sound very similar, don't they? This really just looks like mere dialects of the common language. But the other point of uh, doing this sort of um, comparison is to, to point out the diversity of orthography. Look at all these different words, all these different letter combinations for making the sh sound. This is crazy. Wouldn't it be better, the Panslavs argue, if we had some sort of common way of writing the sh sound, and then we could more easily read a text written in some other dialect because the, the orthography would seem more familiar. Let's reform the orthography. Now, Kolar, unlike uh, many of his colleagues, didn't actually propose any particular orthography. The only comment he made is, we should use a Slavic orthography and not borrow the orthography of a neighboring people. 
<clears throat> so in terms of this particular chart, he would have uh, opposed the sorbian SCH, that looks German to him. He would have opposed the Dalmatian SC, that looks like Italian. Do something that's properly Slavic, that was the argument he made in his book. Finally, um, Kolar made a proposal that um, perhaps we could, in modern terms, think of as a, a project of identity, but which in the 19th century was more often formulated as a question of the name. He's interested in uh, how people describe themselves. So he says a pole shouldn't just be a pole, he should be a Slavopole. What does that mean? He doesn't just read books in his own dialect, that he's to say own books in Polish. He also reads Russian books, Czech books, Serbian books, and so forth. The Russian is not just the Russian, but a Slavo-Russian. <clears throat> and so we have these new ethnonyms, the Slavo-Pole, the Slavo-Russian, the Slavo-Czech, and the Slavo-Serb. So that's the thought of Jan Kolar. Now Jan Kolar um, influenced um, many people of his generation. And one of his more ardent disciples was my second Panslav, Ludovic Guy. Uh, Guy was um, uh, from what is today Croatia and uh, is best remembered for having founded a magazine in this portrait, you can see he has the magazine on the table next to him. It's called Danica, uh, which means Morning Star, published in Zagreb. But uh, Guy uh, originally studied law and was uh, found himself in Buddha for part of his studies. And there he met Kolar and was very influenced by, by uh, Kolar's uh, ideas. When he uh, published his magazine, you can see the Kolar and influence right away. Just a sample page from Danica in which a uh, slow, uh, translation, the South Slavic translation of Jan Kolar's Reciprocity is published, just to give a sense of the degree to which they're on the same page. So it's the, the, same, um, the same ideas, only uh, you know, rewritten in the uh, Croatian dialect, uh, all the way to the point that they change the spelling of Kolar's names. Jan Kolar becomes Ivan Kolar with one L. I think that's kind of funny. Guy is uh, also famous for having written this um, orthography. Um, Guy is a very important person in the, in the history of Croatian orthography. Uh, there's two things I would like to point out about the title page of this book. First off is the ethnonym. This is the orthography of what? It is the orthography of Horvatoslavic Koga, the orthography of uh, Croatia Slavic. So Kolar suggested that he should consider himself a Slava Croat. He's described his uh, orthography as a Croatian Slavic orthography, but I think I see Kolar's influence there. I also see Kolar's influence in the um, in these two letters, the N Hacek and the L Hacek, neither of which exist in modern Croatian. Uh, but um, Guy was constantly following the Czech model on the idea that let's reform orthography in such a way that Slavic Czech orthography is Slavic. Let's do what the Czechs are doing. Uh, Guy is credited with having introduced the C Hacek and the S Hacek into, uh, into Croatian, and those stuck, even if the N Hacek and the L Hacek did not. In the text of this bilingual uh, um, orthography, that is to say, it's published both in, uh, in uh, Croatian Slavic and in German, you know, sort of on opposite pages, we can see once again the idea of the great Slavic language with all of its uh, four main dialects. But not only language of dialects, but the same dialect taxonomy, four dialects, just like in, uh, in Kolar's taxonomy. Um, he also talks about the Slavic nation. He does not, in the orthography, talk about the Slavic tribes. He merely talks about the Slavic brothers. And who are the Slavic brothers? Uh, the Bohemians, Poles, and Russians. So it's a very similar taxonomy. He doesn't actually use the word tribe anywhere in the orthography. If you want to see him talk about the Slavic tribes, you have to look at his other texts. So here we have the Illyrians are a Slavic tribe, a tribe of what? Well, a tribe of the Slavic nation. So it's as explicitly Kolar and Panslav as you could ask for. He also talks about the kinship or dialect with other Slavic dialects, like the Czech dialect or the Russian dialect. Uh, so the thing that he's codifying, the thing that for which he's writing his orthography, he imagines as a dialect. Dialect of what? Dialect of the entire Slavic language. The third Panslav I want to talk about is a less faithful disciple. Ludovic Stur, in his youth, had a proper Kolarian education. He went to the same high school that Kolar did. And then when he became a teacher at that high school, he signed Kolar's poetry to his students. Um, at one point, he studied in Germany. And while in, um, in Lusatia, in the, so the German minority, uh, the Slavic minority in Germany, he told the Lusatians to cultivate a reciprocity. It's as Kolarian as you could ask for. 
But at a certain point in Hitler's life, he broke with Kolar over the taxonomy of the four main uh, Slavic dialects, and he cultivated a new a standardization for Slovak. This is his uh, grammar book. Um, and then more importantly than the grammar book, he wrote a pamphlet on the grammar book and why it was so great. The title of that pamphlet is the Slovak dialect of the need to write in this dialect. And the key passage is, we Slovaks are a tribe, and as a tribe, we have our own dialect, which is different and distinct from the Czech dialect. Uh, so his taxonomy is Slavic nation with tribes and their dialects, and the tribes divided into sub-dialects. So the meta taxonomy is identical with the one I showed you earlier from Kolar, a language divided into dialects, divided into sub-dialects. What's different about Stur is the ethnonyms with which he populated this taxonomy. Uh, Kolar's taxonomy looked like this, four main dialects with sub-dialects. Stur's taxonomy looks like this. So a lot of the sub-dialects have been elevated to the status of proper dialects. So, uh, once again, not, not, not Kolar four, but rather these 11, including we Slovaks with our own Slovak dialect. So he proudly proclaims the dialecthood of Slovak. We are not a sub-dialect as uh, some people might have thought. Now, Stur is a national hero in modern Slovakia. Um, these are the banknotes of the wartime Nazi puppet state, the independent state of Slovakia, the uh, communist uh, Czechoslovakia from the uh, post-war period, and then the modern Slovak banknotes of an EU member state. So you could be a fascist sympathizer, a communist, or a EU Democrat. Everyone can agree, Ludovic Stur is a Slovak national hero. He has a town named after him. And it's not just an official thing to glor the glorification of Stur. He also has a, a coffee house named after him. Sturbox, get it? Ha ha. I think that's really funny. Um, but uh, his linguistic work means that the um, Academy of Linguistics, Institute of Linguistics of the Slovak Academy of Sciences is named after Ludovic Stur. And I think it's kind of funny that the Linguistic Academy of the Slovak Academy of Sciences the Institute charged with the defense and cultivation of the Slovak language is named after somebody who didn't believe in the Slovak language, who believed in the Slovak dialect. I think that's funny, but the uh, certain Slovaks seem to be embarrassed. So here is a Jan Kacula, he's a Slovak linguist, and in an article on uh, Stur's linguistic works, he has this to say, the understanding of Slovak as a national language strengthens Stur in his decision. Now, he didn't understand Slovak as a national language. He very explicitly used the word dialect. And uh, Kachula knows that. So he just says, when you read the word dialect, just understand that word to mean language. You know, just substitute a word in the primary sources. And that comes up several times in his text. Ludovic Stur talks about the Slovak dialects. And Kachula says, well, what he really means is languages, to the point that he changes the, the, the primary sources when he cites them, which is an outrage. This turns out to be a popular strategy for discussing Ludovic Stur. There's a whole slew of scholars I could find who said uh, the Slovak dialects, that is to say, he really means languages. And on the bottom, initially, it uh, translates tribe as nation. Stur says we Slovaks are a tribe with our own, uh, own dialect. Well, what he really means is, and just substitute the words in the primary sources. The title of Stur's book is routinely mistranslated. There's a whole bunch of people who translate it as the Slovak language. You need to write in this language. That's a lot of mistranslations, isn't it? And other scholars talk about it as the Slovak tongue, especially writing in this tongue. Well, it's fair to point out here that the Slavic word for tongue is yazik, and it's also the word for language. It's like in Latin, lingua means tongue, and also language. Uh, so these translations are all incorrect. As for the key passage, we Slovaks are a tribe. And as a tribe, we have our dialect, different to think from the Czech dialect. Well, this is uh, repeatedly cited. Um, although if you look at this particular citation, you can see that it's spelled wrong. How do you spell the word me, the first word, M-I or M-Y? Kmen, does the Kmen have an act, uh, hot check or not? This has been, uh, you know, modernized uh, rather than cited in the original. Okay, never mind. But here's the passage, quoted. We Slovaks are tribe, as a tribe, we have our dialect citation. And the very next sentence says, this declaration of an independent Slovak language, da 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 how can that be a declaration of a Slovak language? Even if you, on some linguistic grounds, are convinced that Slovak is in fact a national language, in, according to some definition of language could, that is known only to you, even if you believe that, this sentence talks about a declaration of languagehood. How can you declare languagehood 
without using the word language. I was merely sight sure as saying nation and language. I found this passage and was, was, was outraged by it. That is not the passage at all. I checked the footnote. The footnote again just goes to Stuart's collected works. So I consulted Stuart's collected works you know, in the modern spelling. And there's a footnote there that says, Stuart's term that coincides with today's Yazik. Therefore, Slovak dialect equals Slovak language. And this theory of terminological transformation is popular. Here's another passage. The main idea of Stuart's work, Slovak their nation, as a nation they have their own language, parentheses, in the terminology of the day, tribe and dialect. I even found a whole article on uh, the terminological question from Vincent Blanar, he's a Slovak scholar. Um, the, the title of the article is on the terminology of the Matica years. And if the Matica years is, is a little obscure to some people, this audience, it's, it's these dates. There's an important um, institution called the Matica Slovenska. It's founded in such and such a time. The Hungarian parliament disestablishes it such and such a time. That defines the Matica years. So, okay, what is Blanar saying about the Matica years? He says, in the Matica years, there is a simplification in the semantic structure of the word Narecia. Simplification is as follows. In the Stur era, the meaning of this word was language. And he defines a language in, uh, in terms of a Slavic and a German word. So German is the rock against which the changing word of a Slovak word can be measured. So the language is, uh, the word Narecia used to mean Jazik Sprache, but in the 1960s it changed, then the meaning became dialect Mundart. Now, the, the best thing I can say about Blanar's hypothesis is that it is falsifiable. If this were true, that the meaning of the word had changed, we would be able to track that by looking at encyclopedias. We could track that by looking at dictionaries. You could look up the word Narecia into a dictionary published before the 1860s and see if it was defined as Sprache. So let's check that out. Here's a dictionary published in 1842, which is before the 1860s. And you can see that Wundar is equated with Narecia dialect and not with Sprache. Here's one from 1854, Mundart Narecia dialect. Uh, Juraj uh, Palikovic, who is the person who taught Stur uh, in high school, Stur's high school and structure, also wrote a dictionary. Narecia means Mundart dialectical. And Stur himself defined the word Narecia in his text. This is the, the definition he gives in his original, um, in his original grant. So uh, I think that the, the, the theory of terminological uh, transformation can't be sustained. Um, there's a similar misrepresentation of the ideas of Ludovic Dai. I pointed it out earlier that he described his orthography as a Croatian Slavic orthography. And yes, we see the, the, uh, the ethnonym here. This ethnonym has been repeatedly mistranslated. Uh, some people just remove the Slavic entirely. Foundations of Croatian orthography, and you can see that the, the Slavic Skoda is just missing. Just change it to Hrvatsko. That's what he must have really meant. So we don't need to cite the title of the book correctly. We can just change what it ought to have been, uh, which is a terrible way of proceeding. Now, uh, another way that this has been mistranslated is as follows. Now, some people describe it as an outline of Croatian Slavonian orthography. Uh, now, the word Slavonian and the word Slavic do have the same root. So this has a certain plausibility about it. Let me uh, briefly outline what's at stake here. This is a, a map published from Stuart's era. And the uh, Royal Croatia, Croatia proper, is only this tiny uh, territory near Zagreb. There's also a uh, Croatian military district. And then there's a thing called uh, uh, Turkish Croatia, which is there. Uh, Slavonia and the Slavonian military district are there. So if you combine the Croatia of the 19th century with the Slavonia of the, of the 19th century, and particularly if you, if you take out the Turkish Slavonia, uh, Turkish Croatia, you get this. And uh, I guess you can agree that this territory is, uh, is awfully, is much closer to the modern Croatian Republic than is that territory. So I think they're trying to depict Guy as someone who is foreseeing or foreshadowing the, um, the modern Croatian state. Uh, so whatever you think about this translation in English, however, I hope you agree that there's no justification for German speaking scholars to substitute the word Slavonischen for Slavishen. The text is Croatian Slavishen. And a whole bunch of scholars apparently reading only the, the Croatian version, only reading only the Slavic version and back translating, 
that's the kind of real wedding really meant in Slavonish. Even though the the book was published by Lingley, you should be able to check what he meant by looking at the original text. Indeed, a whole bunch of scholars can't cite the, the German title correctly. I found these uh, four people who get four different titles. They can check the original German. It's not Entwurf, it's Kleine Entwurf. It's not Grundriss, it's not Rechtschreibung. These are modern German words that are, trans are reasonable translations of Pravopis, but not good transliterations of orthographia. Scholars you clear and clear about, uh, about uh, their summaries of Guy's Pan-Slavism. Uh, uh, Robert Greenberg of the University of Auckland, who's a very nice guy, by the way, um, said that Guy had accepted the notions of Pan-Slavism. He's aware of Guy's Pan-Slavism, but still says that for Guy, there were four main Slavic languages. He ignores the dialectical nature of, uh, of what it is. He also says he saw the Croats as belonging to an Illyrian nation. No, he didn't. He saw Croats as belonging to the Slavic nation and the Illyrian tribe of the Slavic nation. Here's a, a final passage on Guy. It says that Guy divided the Slavs into four nations, brackets, tribes, and brackets, the, the terminological substitution theory again. And uh, that he divided the Slavic language into four literary languages, dialects. So I put it to you that the word dialect is not a synonym for literary language. Those are not synonyms. You can't substitute that one term for the other. Even on its face, though, this is not correct. Guy didn't believe that there were four literary languages. He thought that there should only be four literary languages. He was aware of the much greater uh, diversity of orthography, thought that great diversity was problematic, thought that Dalmatians Slavonians and Croatians agree on a common orthography. Instead of having several, we should have fewer. <coughs> Let's see if we can get the number of Slavic orthographies down to four. That was his position. The final thing that's interesting about this particular passage is that it miscites Kolar at the same time. It says that Guy uh, borrowed from Kolar the fourfold classification of the Slavic languages and peoples. Uh, and the word Narod can also be translated as nation. That's not what Kolar believed at all. Kohler didn't believe that there are four Slavic languages and four Slavic peoples. He thought there was one Slavic language and one Slavic people. He believed in four tribes and speaking four dialects. John Kohler's kite, tribes and dialects of Slavic nation has also been mistranslated and miscited as the dialects of the Slavic nations in the plural. Now, so you can check that for yourself that the original is nation instead of nationen. And um, there's also the terminological substitution theory as you can see in Rosenbaum's text, uh, tribe not rich yet, that really means nation and language, according to, uh, to Rosenbaum. Um, this is my uh, final passage from the historical and Kolar. You can see it in this passage, um, Kolar is an accurate description of Kolar's reciprocity, uh, four tribes and their dialects, that's correct. And then the very next passage, when he talks about uh, Kolar's attitude towards uh, Slovak in particular, he says, the Slovak dialect, i.e. the Slovak language, is rich, and, and so on and so forth. Kolar not only didn't believe in the Slovak dialect that could be equated to the Slovak language, he believed in the Slovak sub-dialect. He classified Slovak as a menšiš nášeč, not even as a nášeč. He believed in a Czech nášeč. So this is, this is three times wrong. It's wrong that the nášeč can be uh, the, the, the language. It's wrong that Slovak is a nášeč. It's, it's, it's mistaken all around. So, what is going on here? How do we explain this pattern of mistranslations? And I suggest here that there is a pattern. You can see people translating the word Nazarec as language. You don't see people turning the word Yazik into the word dialect. You see people use, taking the word Kemen and saying that it means uh, nation. You don't see people taking the word Narod and saying, well, what he really means is tribe. All these mistranslations go in one direction. And the direction is that it effaces Pan-Slavism from the historical record. It becomes impossible to see the existence of Pan-Slavism because the titles of books and key passages in, in those books are routinely mistranslated in such a way as to erase Pan-Slavism from the historical record. So what's going on? Well, I'm not entirely sure, but I have some theories. The first theory that, that came to my mind is probably the first theory that came to your mind. Maybe people are nationalists. A patriotic Slovak doesn't like the idea that Ludovic Stor didn't believe in a Slovak language. So uh, out of patriotism, he corrects uh, the historical figure so as to promote the national ideology retroactively. And I think some of that is going on, but I don't think it's the whole story. Give you a, a sample of why I think that. 
uh, consider Hans Kohn, who wrote a book on Pan-Slavism. Now, Kohn's description of Kolar uh, was as follows. Each dialect should drive uh, vitality from its contact with the others. Books should distribute books of all Slovak dialects. That's all correct. Peter Asner says Slavs should learn the principal four languages. And that's not correct. <coughs> should be Slavs should learn the principal four dialects. So Hans Kohn well, was from Prague. He's a Bohemian Jew. Uh, he fought on the Eastern Front and was captured and imprisoned in Turkestan, liberated by the Czechoslovak region. But he didn't have any sense of Czechoslovakism because when the First World War was over, he went to Israel and became a Zionist. He was eventually disillusioned with Zionism's um, violence and oppression of uh, Palestinian Arabs, went to the United States and became a professor there. So I don't think we can describe Kohn as a, as a Czechoslovak nationalist. I think that here the question is uh, anachronism. I think that he is uh, aware that today people recognize that there are more than one Slavic language. People today don't believe in the unity of the Slavic language. They instead think of Slavic as a language family and project that taxonomy of the Slavic world back in time. I think anachronism is a, is a more important cause, particularly for the foreign scholars who can't translate these words correctly. But I also wonder if the anachronism is equally influential on the Slavic scholars themselves. So I've started to think that nationalism is less of a cause of these two mistranslations than, uh, than you might have thought. And a third a lesson to draw from this, uh, this story, though, is the importance of studying contingency. Now, there's a big trend in East European studies these days to sort of move away from nationalism. People are very dissatisfied with the traditional national waking narrative, where the, you know, the primal Slovaks created their Slovak nation, the the Croatian people have always dreamed of an independent Croatian state from time immemorial. People are skeptical of this heroic narrative. But the main result in the historiography has been to move away from nationalism entirely. There's lots of books these days talking about the city as a site of multi-ethnic encounters, what it, what it means to be in Lviv, Lvov, Rembenek. Or people talk about regions. You know, Bohemia is a place where different nations and cultures interact with each other. And the Bana as a site of inter-ethnic uh, interaction. There's, a, there's stuff about the imperial loyalties. Uh, Peter Yeltsin's book is all about the loyalty to the empire as a whole. And I think this is all good work. I'm not criticizing this work. Um, I think it's useful to problematize that everyone was a nation was a nationalist. National difference is important. We have to thank Tara Zakhra for introducing the concept of national difference to us. But if we do want to talk about nationalism, if we do think nationalism is an important thing to study, Maybe we should come up with a, a way to study nationalism without giving that teleological narrative. And there's a way to do that is to study nationalism that fail, nationalism that don't develop into an independent nation state, like Pan-Slavism. I think there's lots of evidence of Pan-Slavism in the, in the primary sources. And so I think it's worth studying and worth thinking about. But if we are interested in these uh, um, contingent nationalisms and these failed nationalisms, and this is my final point, we must go back to the primary sources. The secondary literature is demonstrably unreliable. Uh, titles of books, quotations from books are routinely mistranslated as if by some uh, conspiracy to efface alternate national ideas from the historical record. And I think that's a problem. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Alexander. Um, and uh, this was a very lively uh, presentation. You were standing on your standing desk, I suppose. So you were actually lecturing like we used to in the pre-COVID times. Uh, I appreciated that. I have a lot of questions, but uh, I'm going to start um, also collecting uh, questions from the queue and uh, feel free to raise your hand, your virtual hand, and uh, I can call on you um, while we give uh, some time to Alexander to um, um, uh, sit down and uh, uh, so my first question is um, is related to your your final uh, part of the presentation where you kind of went closer to an explanation for a lot of this, right? Um, and I was wondering to what extent you would think, even in nationalism, you can break down that um, explanation into at least two camps, if not several more, as you know. Uh, so there is the argument of modernization theories that could say, well, it's, nationalism is almost like a byproduct. So this process you're develop, you're discussing maybe is a process that is a byproduct of, you know, pu pu a push for homogenization for a, what Gellner would call um, 
uh, a medium for um, uh, so the higher culture and, and, and all those processes that are not necessarily top down as you implied them from an organic intellectual point of view, right? Or a, what I would see as someone at the a capital in a country saying uh, to his scientific board, create a national history, right? And misrepresent and misquote things, right? Those are two different ways to get to the nationalism answer, right? So I wanted you to give me, give us a sense of which one of the two um, nationalisms you think is uh, not really what's going on, right? Because those are not the same kind of mechanisms behind the term or the explanation of nationalism. Yeah, and so I think I think that the pan-Slavism is more of a nationalism from below. Uh, this is certainly not particularly state-sponsored. There are, um, I am finding some evidence in my current research about um, the Habsburg government acknowledging the unity of the Slavic language. There are certain odd passages that suggest that Habsburg officials accepted that there was only one Slavic language divided into dialects, but they're not interested in promoting it. That's they're, I think they're more responding to the, the, the opinion of Slavic sovereigns who, um, who, who believe in the single Slavic language. The Habsburg government is sort of interested in mediating between languages. It doesn't really have a national project of its own. So in that sense, it's nationalism from below. I think the misrepresentation I'm talking about isn't from the historical actors themselves, but from subsequent scholars. I think it's something that arises in the mid 20th century and continues on in the 21st century. And the misrepresentation I'm talking about is of us, of our colleagues, of you and the people you've met at conferences, rather than uh, the historic figures. So, so that actually you could strengthen your argument if you're planning to write this up more. Uh, I, I don't know if you've already published on exactly this argument. Um, I would. Um, I would emphasize this because it strengthens your argument because most people, or many people, not most people, I don't know what most people think, but I assume many people would think that there is more top down. There is this view of an organic intellectual or of the, you know, the state kind of led projects. I think what you're saying makes it even more a stronger point about the anachronism argument you're offering um, or, or um, the, even the contingency kind of uh, uh, third argument. Uh, but I wanted to ask you before, uh, uh, we're getting a couple of questions now, uh, to give more time to people uh, to collect their thoughts and ask more specific questions. I wanted to ask also a follow-up on uh, this. Um, you mentioned that it's important to, to study failed movements like Miroslav Kroch has done and others. Um, but not many others, I agree with you actually, <laughs> not many others. Um, but, but I wanted to ask you, what do you think explains which ethnonyms, you gave us some amazing quotes there with certain ethnonyms that many of us have not even heard of, especially if we're not studying that area, right? Um, and I often um, ask people who study, you know, uh, state formation and so on and so forth, and they say, well, if you had strong institutions in the medieval times, or if you had the strong state at X point in time, then you'll have a modern nation and a lot of a nation state. And a lot of these cases that you're talking about may have had quite prominent institutions to the extent that they were mentioned in those treaties you're talking about, but they kind of dissipated later. So what do you think is the selection mechanism? Is it pure contingency or is there anything, anything more systematic you have to tell us about that? Um, I haven't uh, looked into that question of why this ethnonym triumphs over that ethnonym in great detail, but my initial thought is it's probably something that happens on a case by case basis. So I would I would be a little hesitant, um, yeah, okay. hesitant to to you know talk about a, a broader theory. Um, so shall I answer I, Sobchenko's right. question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So do, do you, Alexei, do you want to uh, turn on your mic and uh, or you're fine if he replies uh, from your chat question? Okay, I guess, why don't you repeat the, the question though? Because... So the, the question is is easily visible in the chat, but he wants to know but is everybody... yeah. in yeah. the Hapsic Empire is similar to the pro-Russian sentiments and uh, wants me to compare it to Russian Slavophilia. So um, it may be that uh, Sobchenko arrived a little late and didn't hear my initial comments, but uh, yes, yes, I, um, I, I think that um, like part of the trouble is of talking about pan-Slavism is that everyone has their own definition of pan-Slavism. And uh, there's all these taxonomies of Slavisms and none of them are a consensus. 
Um, so many people see that I'm going to give a talk on Pan-Slavism, are interested in Great Russian Expansionism and say, oh, here's a talk about Great Russian Expansionism. And then I sit here and talk about spelling reform and, uh, and say, well, where's the Great Russian Expansionism? I'm sorry, I have to disappoint you. My Pan-Slavs are not interested in Great Russian Expansionism. They kind of have warm, fuzzy feelings towards Russia because Russia is a sort of fellow Slavic country. I mean, they're certainly not anti-Russian. But they're also not anti-Habsburg for the most part. They're perfectly happy living in the Habsburg monarchy. Um, they don't have any desire to join a Russian state um, because they're not really interested in state questions at all. What they're interested in is how can we reform our orthography? How can we how can we more effectively learn the folk songs from other tribes? And that's what they're concerned about. So, but Alexander, isn't there a contradiction there, in the sense that uh, if meaning uh, we make so, you know you put a lot of emphasis on the term nation versus tri versus you know nation equals language and then there are tribes that are dialects right they have dialects and i, I got that message very clearly uh and I, i'm sure others did too and then if there is a, is that if we're attributing so much importance in what terms they used can we really call them nationalists if they were fine living under house well so right? i have um, i have already published on this question so i could well, i, I know. Could send you I send you to my scholarly works here um, I said the, the fact I that they the, use the word nation is enough for me to say that they're nationalists. Um, and if their idea of the nation, meaning a source of literary greatness and so forth, uh, makes you unhappy because you expect the nation to be uh, the foundation of the state, then your unhappiness is your problem because our job is to explain historical figures, not to police the way that they use their terminology. So these guys, they imagine the nation in a not, as a, as a non-state structure. They imagine it as a source of literature. They equate it with the language. They certainly are interested in their language. And so they talk about the national, the national language and they talk about the nation. And uh, both the historical figures and the subsequent scholars say, well, if they use the word nation, I know from my own understanding of the nation that that implies the desire for statehood. And the Slavs say, no, we're not interested in our own state. We wanna talk about literature. And uh, so then they're accused of lying and deceit and so forth. Uh, but I maybe, think they're, they're sincere. They're not interested in a Slavic state. So maybe in your presentation, you can talk also about the problem of statism or state lens. Like, you know, there's another- Harris, Harris, you're asking me to do all these extra talks in the middle of a talk. I can only do one <laughs> thing. You gave, me, you gave me 40 minutes. You didn't give me a whole series True. of hours True. to talk about all the different issues. True. I can't anticipate which question people are gonna ask. So, you know, try to be focused in the talk. And only exactly. talk Alexei thing. has a follow-up though, Alexander. <clears throat> yes, uh, my question is the following. Whatever it was in 19th century, eventually it led to the collapse of the Habsburg Empire and the strong, I'm specifically talking about the case of Czechoslovakia, strong anti-German feelings, which led to Sudetenland crisis and eventual expulsion of uh, of uh, Sudeten Germans from, uh, and I remember very clearly the 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 the, the, the footage uh, for those. We now we are going to stay with our Slavic brethren, Russians, meaning basically, and Czechs were the the ones who were most punished for their pro-Slavic feelings, and these feelings come from the pan-Slavic <laughs> pan um, ideas of the 19th century and. I remember also very clearly the quotation from an Austrian German newspaper sometimes in <coughs> early 20th century that our uh, Czechs would like to, jo to, to, to become independent nation, would like to be uh, allies of Russia and let them have it. They will be punished properly. So is, do you, anyway, was there anybody who was saying, listen, what we are doing is a very, very dangerous thing. We are European civilization. We are living in a relatively prosperous country. And if we are going to ally ourselves with Russia, uh, it's going to be bad. Thank you. Um, so there is famously a quotation from Borovsky who uh, travels to Prague in a pan -Slav Congress or travels to Russia for a pan -Slav Congress. Oh, you, you're muted here, someone? Oh, you're muted, Alexander. Please don't mute me, Harris. Uh, I didn't so mute. There, it says that you've been muted by the host. <laughs> um, I'm not the host. Uh, 
where was I? So there, 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 there is a famous moment where a Czech goes to Prague for the pan slav Congress and um, is not impressed by what he sees. And he comes back home and writes an article, Czech, not Slav. So that is a thing. Uh, but I did notice that in your question, you jumped from, you know, the 19th century led to the collapse of the monarchy, and then you leapt to the sedate and German crisis. I, I put it to you that the First World War and the Second World War had intervened in the meantime. I put it to you that the First World War and the Second World War are complicated events in which a lot of non-Slavic actors, non-Central European actors played a role. So, you know, you can't just draw a straight line without looking at these other factors. I'm interested in the 19th century for its own right. I'm, I'm interested in the 1840s because the 1840s is hell's interesting. And I'm not trying to foresee what happens in 1948. Um, so in the 1840s, what you find is that there's everybody talking about the Slavic nation. And what do they mean by that? They mean they're talking about Slavic literature. But what about an ally, political ally with Russia? That's not, a, that's not their issue at all. They're not thinking in those terms. So Dylan, no, there's, there's lots of other questions. Shall yeah, we get Dylan, to some of these? Dylan has a question first, and then I have two more. Yeah. Sorry, who am I looking at? Dylan. Dylan. Do you want to ask a question, Dylan? Sure. Um, it's just that um, given the more semi pan Slavic natures of Czechoslovakia and Yugoslavia, when those countries existed, uh, I guess both before the World Wars and, or before the Second World War and also especially after it, were they, were the governments of those countries or the people within them just as private citizens or as academics, did they behave or did they treat the figures about whom you're speaking differently than um, okay. the modern governments and it, academics do? I, it did take me a little bit to grasp this question, but I think I've got it now. Um, I think in the, when there was Czechoslovakia and when there was Yugoslavia, there was a great desire to try and transform these figures into Czechoslovaks and Yugoslavs. So the Pan-Slavism was erased and replaced with Czechoslovakism or Yugoslavism, or by enemies of Czechoslovak or Yugoslav nationalism to make them into Slovaks or Serbs or you know um, Slovenes or whatever, more particularist nationalisms uh, as a way of fighting against Czechoslovakia or Yugoslavia, because uh, Czechoslovakia and Yugoslavia always had discontents. Um, so there were people who talked about Pan-Slavism because people still had a sort of memory of Pan-Slavism, um, but it was normally viewed as some sort of initial, you know, apprentice phase before they learned the true nature of our proper nationality. Um, I think the modern day attitude towards these people is, uh, I think there's more of a sense of we're just forgetting about all this because, uh, you know, people are more interested in the 20th century. Um, you know, I, you know, I did my PhD in Wisconsin and nobody cared about Slovakia there. And now I'm in, in uh, New Zealand and nobody cares about Slovakia here. I'm all alone. Uh, you know, I talk about my pan Slavs and people listen politely, but nobody really cares. Uh, but I was a little frustrated because, you know, I, I presented my work in Bratislava. And even in Bratislava, people don't really care. You know, they, they want me to talk about the world wars. They want to talk about communism. They want to talk about fascism. And the 1840s is not a trendy period. People aren't interested in thinking about it at all. So uh, actually, the main trend is to rewrite them in terms of contemporary national thinking. I think um, uh, Andrea's, uh, Andrea Ritivoy's um, uh, question is relevant on this. Uh, I, I don't know if she, want, uh, if she wants to um, say it herself or I should, yeah. Andrea, yeah, I'm happy to say it, but I have to apologize. It, this is not my area, so I find the discussion fascinating. I've done more work on Romania and on uh, linguistic arguments in the competition between uh, or the, the contested identity disputes between Hungary and Romania. But I'm trying to wrap my mind around sort of like a political agenda that's behind this um, argument around pan-Slavicism. And I might be very anachronistic myself, but I couldn't help but think of Engels's point about the small nations being doomed to fail. So I don't know if there is any connection there or if you wanna say anything more about what it is that these intellectuals are looking for politically in um, their arguments about pan-Slavicism. Thank you. So uh, Kolar's main agenda is to promote the glory of Slavic literature. He, um, he's very influenced by Herder. He uh, is religious. He thinks that each nation has its own unique role to play in the unfolding of God's plan. 
He thinks that because the Slavs haven't done anything glorious in history up to this point, it must mean that God is reserving for them some great future destiny. To promote that great future destiny, we must cultivate our literature. And then when the great Slavic geniuses arise and write the great Slavic literary masterpieces, we will fulfill our goal. So that's what Kolar is thinking about. Um, Stur does have a more traditional political agenda. And um, his agenda is that he wants to stop the policy of modernization. So that ought to be very familiar to a Romanian scholar, the idea that modernization is, is wicked and bad. He codifies his distinct Slovak because he hears the, the Slovaks, he hears the Magyars saying, well, you Slovaks, you're so pro-Czech, that means you're not good Hungarians. And he says, okay, we'll cut our ties to the Czechs. We'll promote a uniquely Hungarian Slavic literature. The Slovaks are one of the peoples inside the glorious kingdom of Hungary. Let's all be Hungarians together, but we are Hungarian Slavs and we have our own Slavic literature that isn't the Magyar literature. As a, a sop to Magyar sensibilities, this has absolutely no consequence whatsoever. The Magyars want them to assimilate. They want them to speak Hungarian. They're not interested in uh, a uniquely Hungarian variety of Slavic. But that's what Stuart's is thinking. Uh, he's, he's doing it as a sop to Hungarian uh, sensibilities. Marta Lukasiewicz is next. Okay, th thank you. Uh, yes, I wanted to uh, ask Professor Maxwell whether he has uh, looked uh, into the literature, particularly poetry of uh, pupil students uh, of Ludovic Stur, uh, because they, they were very uh, influential and continue to be influential for just uh, Slovak nationalism and kind of historic memory. And just uh, anecdotally, I have uh, noticed that uh, some of the um, older versions of their texts may include more references to Slavs that are in the current rewrites of their poetry rewritten to, to Slovak to mean uh, either adjective or noun. So I, I was just curious whether he has looked into that at all. Thank you. So I haven't um, studied the literary texts in great detail. I confess I'm more interested in grammar book introductions than in poetry. Um, I have looked at Chalupa and uh, Sladkovich a little bit, and um, I did notice these sorts of anachronisms. I think that the, the acronym uh, Slovensky Slovansky, however, is complicated because I think in the early 19th century, the Slavs just didn't distinguish these concepts very well um, and use them, use the vowel changes as stylistic alternatives in the same way that in English, we have two ways of spelling gray. We can spell G-R-A-Y, G-R-E-Y, and there's no real meaning between that. So there's a, there's a process in which those two vowels are each assigned a separate meaning in the 19th century through a complicated process that I looked at a little bit but didn't study to the end. Um, so I think there's a tendency to take the old Slavic, old Slovak poetry and rewrite it in the modern Slovak spelling, which we saw with my, um, with my, uh, you know, the Stur quotation, mi slovacis me kmen, is a kmen of the hotchek or not, that sort of thing. And so I, I think there's uh, there's two things going on when the word Slovensky turns into Slovansky or Slovansky turns into Slovensky. On the one hand, you want to efface the pan of the historical record. But on the other hand, we just want to correct this old funny old spelling and put to do it in the modern spelling. So there's sort of a separate wrinkle there. It seems to me that if you find someone say, ah, you know, Lubim Svoj Slovensky Jazik or something like that, uh, it's, just, it's just not clear from context if he means Slovak or Slavic. It's just not clear. And if you really want to want to make a strong case, you have to look for the geographical clues. So when they say, ah, the Slovensky language is so beautiful, it, it rings from Bratislava to the Tatras, from the Tatras to the Danube, aha, well, that's a sort of Slovak symbolic geography. Maybe there he does mean Slovak. But I cited in my book a, a poem where he says, uh, oh, the Slovansky language, it burns, the glory of it burns like a fire on the mountains of the Caucasus. And it seems to me that the Caucasus mountains, even the most expansive Slovak is not claiming the Caucasus. That sounds more like a pan-Slavic uh, symbolic geography. So I think that Slovensky Slovansky is really problematic and um, you, we just shouldn't make any firm conclusions one way or the other on the basis of the ethnonym alone. We have to look for the extra clues, the geographical clues. So thank you for an excellent question. 
So um, I, I'm going to follow up on something I mentioned before we started, and you kind of, you know, intrigued me with saying, ask this in the Q&A. So um, I, I was wondering to what extent, I mean, we, we um, I think you already kind of, uh, made, you know, put to rest the whole question about whether you're interested in the Russian expansionism or Russian forms of pan-Slavism that some people may have in their minds. Um, but there is no doubt that when, you know, there's some form of solidarity expressed if you believe these people were nationalists and they thought nation and language was equated, right? Um, there is, if, you, if we consider that in a non-anachronistic, non-statist kind of manner as pure nationalism, in a, a, meaning a, some sense of solidarity, I suppose, right? Or be, a sense of belonging to a group, right? Um, oh, and you can correct me if I'm wrong about how I understand their type of nationalism. Um, then is there any room for some form of institutionalization that this may take at some point? Is there any such discussion? It, not a state, modern state kind of thing, but, but how would this manifest itself, right? Well, um, Stur, for example, um, promotes a Slavic, sorry, a, a Slovak uh, administrative district. Um, you know, when, the, when the revolution comes, 1848 revolution comes, um, his plan is not a Slovak independent state. He's happy to stay under the Habsburgs, but he wants the Slovak, or he wants the Slavic language to be used in local administration. So let's take um, the Kingdom of Hungary and inside the Kingdom of Hungary make a province. And inside that province, then the, you know, the local schools and the local county administration will be in, in Slavic. Um, I did some work on encyclopedia definitions of Slavic. Um, so, you know, basically the research was I looked at every encyclopedia I could find. I looked at the word Slavic and you get a list. Oh, the Slavs are an Indo-European people. They include the Russians, Ukrainians, Belarusians, and you get a list. So I looked to see who's on the list and who's not on the list. And I made a chart. So, and so you can arrange it you know, chronologically and follow a column down and watch, for example, the Macedonians appear. There's no Macedonians on these lists of Slavs in the 19th century, even in the early 20th century, suddenly about 1960, boom, the Macedonians appear. It's really fun to look at this chart and see who's there and who's not there and, and so forth. Um, but okay, I made this chart, what does it show? And one of the conclusions I got out of it is that having an independent state is not so important for winning recognition. It's more important to have an administrative district. So the fact that the kingdom of Bohemia is such a well acknowledged administrative unit helps create the sense of Czechness as a separate language. Uh, whereas the fact that there isn't a single Slovene administrative unit, but rather Carinthia, Carniola, so on and so forth, that the Croats are divided between Croatia proper, Slovenia, Dalmatia, et cetera, makes it harder for those groups to have the formal acknowledgement. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and actually, in fact, you indirectly are answering my previous question as well, one of my previous questions. <laughs> and I know Rock uh, Serger also put uh, one of his articles there from Nationality's papers. Let's promote our journal also. Um, so uh, I don't see any other questions. We have another 10 minutes. Um, so if, if um, I don't see another question, I can ask another one myself. There seems to be a lot of interest, Alexander, though, for your topic. So I don't know, uh, maybe you're mis uh, uh, under underestimating the interest in this. Um, so so my, my other question is that often, you know, in political science, we often say language is a dialect with an army behind it, right? Uh, so uh, how do you respond to that, right? I mean, I know- well, Okay, you know I want to say, that. I have also published on that witticism. Uh, I have a whole article. I'm the world authority on the Weinreich criticism. Uh, the, the, the basic idea is this. Um, linguists do not have a definition of language versus dialecthood. Um, and if you look at linguists and how they talk about it, um, they, they, they break into two main schools. The one school they say, um, this is some sort of political question that has nothing to do with linguistics. Um, so don't think about it. Um, it, it Treadgill says, indeed, it is only linguists who understand the extent that these are non-linguistic questions. Uh, is Serbian, Croatian language dialect, you know, you have to look at these political questions because it's not a linguistic question. Therefore, we as linguists, we should be silent on this. 
And then the other linguistic school is um, to say things like, uh, well, there are people who for political reasons want to say that Serbian and Croatian are separate languages, but from a linguistic point of view, it is obvious that they are one. So what we need to do is we need to remove the politics from the conversation entirely and focus only on the purely linguistic factions. So epistemologically, these two positions are diametrically opposed. The one person says, not linguistic, so it's entirely political. The other, the other school says, oh, it's entirely linguistic. Don't be distracted by the political. But the moral of the story in both times is don't look at the political questions, only look at linguistic questions. Let's talk about universal grammar. Have I told you about verb conjugations? You know, the diphthong, friend or foe, whatever it is, let's not, let's not look at the political questions. And um, so I think there's a real opening here for historians and anthropologists and so on and so forth, because you know, we're used to the idea of studying concepts and their influence. You know, I, I mean, I, I often think it's useful to think of studying uh, linguistic nationalism in the same way that we might study a racial nationalism. Uh, you know, the, someone has the idea of the Aryan race and it has these and these political consequences. Um, and we can study those consequences as historians without anybody saying to us, well, but if you look at the biological facts, we can study this, this, that, that. Who cares about the biological facts? We're not talking about the biological facts. We're talking about the idea of race as it played out politically. Well, similarly, let's look at the, how the idea of the language or the idea of the dialect played out politically. And if someone says, wow, but this isn't proper linguistic theory, who cares? We're not interested in that. Anyway, if you look at what linguists are saying, they're saying it's not a linguistic question anyway, at least half of them are, and that's the point of this witticism. But let me do uh, plug my, um, my article on the binary criticism because the article on the binary criticism is more evidence of people misciting uh, uh, the quotation because um, the original phrase is, uh, a language is a dialect with an army and navy. And you just said uh, that has an army. And uh, I can cite you people who say an army and navy and an air force or an army and a flag or uh, this, that, and the other. So people are again, correcting the quotation to make it more palatable. Some people say, oh, uh, a standard language is a dialect with an army and a navy. The original isn't a standard language at all. That's you trying to take the primary source and make it your own agenda. So I, I'm not sure what it is about this language dialect dichotomy that means that people lose the ability to cite a source correctly. Um, but the yeah. other thing I found researching that uh, binary criticism is that hardly anyone cites it correctly. Now the original source is a uh, text in Yiddish. And um, you know, so maybe the ability to read a Yiddish newspaper is not top on everybody's list of priorities. I, by random chance, did do Yiddish in grad school and could read it, so hooray. <laughs> But um, maybe, maybe that's hard to do. Um, but uh, it's routinely attributed to the wrong people. And uh, I eventually found it's been attributed to pretty much every linguist out there. And there's a point where a journal of linguistics tried to investigate, so where does this come from anyway? And they emailed their friends and weren't critical about what they found at all. And they don't seem to be able to figure out where it comes from. So it's, it's miscited. By contrast, the Wikipedia page on the binary criticism cites it correctly the first go. So there's really something about uh, this language dialect, uh, dichotomy which destroys the ability of scholars to engage in the most routine scholarly activity, citing a source from its original location. Yeah, and somebody shared your article already for the audience, so uh, they can uh, go and read it. It's a very good contribution. Yes. Basically. Well, um, you know, thanks to my buddies for uh, for. Uh, I already had sent your full bio, which has all your publications, but this was uh, sent from uh, another one. Uh, so Dylan has the last question on um, whether the Panslavis, uh, Dylan, right? Uh, yes, uh, Dylan, I find this an excellent question. Latin or Syrian. And uh, I, really, I really would love to talk about this at great length. <laughs> um, most of my Panslavs would prefer there to be one alphabet but are kind of aware that people who are used to using Cyrillic don't want to change to Latin, and that people who are used to using Latin don't want to change to Cyrillic. So Herkel, the guy whose original definition I cited, his solution is to have a mixture of both. So he has an alphabet that's essentially the Latin alphabet, but it has three Cyrillic letters. It has Cyrillic sh, it has Cyrillic ch, and has Cyrillic ch. Um, he strangely doesn't have Cyrillic j, he invents his own letter for that. I don't know what was wrong with Sir Lake Joe, but uh, so that's a thing. Um, there are other people who just say, let's use Latin. Other people say, okay, 
people are so attached to their alphabets that we can't um, we can't hope we can't aspire to have one orthography for everybody. Let's just try to reduce the number. So let's focus on getting all South Slavs to write in the same way. Uh, you know, Slovenes and Croats and Dalmatians and Slavonians, we can all write in the same way. Or Serbs, uh, Cro or, um, Slovaks, Moravians, uh, Czechs, Lusatians. Let's try to get those people on the same page. And the Russians can do their own thing. Uh, so you know, we won't be we won't be able to achieve one spelling system, but we can have at least minimize. And then finally, there's a Russian scholar um, named Gilferding. Oh, is it Gilferding? Uh, maybe, I, maybe I'm wrong about that. But there is a Russian scholar who creates his own Pan-Slav alphabet based on Cyrillic. So if you're really keen, you can find both Latin language Pan-Slav alphabets and Cyrillic language Pan-Slav alphabets. Uh, so it's really fun to look at their different uh, orthographic schemes. Well, this was uh, fascinating. You covered a lot of ground in just uh, an hour and 10 minutes or 15 minutes. Um, I want to thank you on behalf of everybody who either cannot turn on their cameras or, or some of us can, as you can see. Some of us are on trains. So there is a lot of dedication in this crowd because uh, I see people <laughs> you know, juggling a lot of things to be on this call, and I appreciate that. You can find uh, the video on our Facebook page um, and I, uh, on uh, the Institute for European Russian Eurasian Studies. Um, where we um, are hosting uh, all these events. And you can find Professor Maxwell's uh, work on his site that I, I shared, uh, and you can just Google his name and you'll find his site. Thank you so much again, Alexander. Thank, Thank you everyone for coming, uh, particularly all my buddies who answered my email. Very nice to see you all. And um, yeah, thank you for your attention. Thank you and keep up the good work, yeah. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.